I never much was a churchgoer myself. I was a Christian, but I didn't like the church atmosphere. The chapel in all of its red and velvet decor, long flowing sheets that hung from the altar with the crown of thorns embroidered into the carpeted tapestry, a skillfully stitched cross that held the crown and a small inscription of the Jew's name for the Christ, consisting of an abbreviation of four letters for their label of the Son of God, I-N-R-I, stemming from the Latin phrase, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Iudeorum, meaning Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Stained glass windows lined the stone walls of the nave every ten feet with an assortment of artwork and shapes that reminded one of a kaleidoscope. When the sun sat just right in the sky, the rays shone down through the multicolored sheets of glass to reflect upon the ancient pews that sat within. Those who cared for his place of worship were nothing short of attentive in their labors in which they took insatiable amounts of pride in. Hazel used to attend this chapel every Sunday morning in her best formal attire that she owned. She owned one patterned floral dress with lace trimming, which was worn every service. She did not come from a wealthy family, so this was the only time that this dress was worn outside of the holidays. Accompanied by this fine dress was a small purse that she carried few items in. One piece of mint candy, a homemade bookmark, and pennies. Typically, there were no more than three pennies, but some Sundays were plentiful when she bought five. It was his will to give sanction to the church and assist in providing housing for a place of worship, such as this. It was the Christian thing to do to bring an offering, no matter how small. Always offer something in the offertory bowl when it was passed down your pew from your neighbor. Place an offering in it before passing it on to your other neighbor, as he was to abide by as well. No matter how poor they may have become, Hazel found a way to bring at least a single haypenny. This was a small amount to offer, but it was more than nothing to give. There were not many who were as faithful as she was to the church. Through snow-ridden winters to sweltering hot summers, she always found a way to make it to the service. She was most often accompanied by her two children, Abigail and Alma. Abigail came down with influenza and passed within two days of the fever setting in. Alma made it to the age of 11 before falling victim to pneumonia. She passed four days later. Hazel had carried many children. All but two of them were stillborn. Though this was a place of worship for our Lord, and we were called to follow the Lord's will, Hazel was not treated as such by the fellow church members. Agnes, who was only a mere year older than Hazel, spit fire upon Hazel on every chance that she had. Coming from a wealthier family, they were able to afford medicine and a doctor. Of course, this did not always bring them the desired outcomes, but their likelihood of survival was greater than those who were poor. Agnes, upon arriving for a service on the Sunday that followed Alma's passing, stopped Hazel before entering into the chapel. What an audacity to see your face here today, Hazel. Agnes stood in front of Hazel with her silken gloved hands on her hips. A pocketbook with an expensive embroidery of a rose on the side hung from an authentic leather band. On the petals of the rose were small diamonds to resemble morning dew that twinkled elegantly in the early dawn's light. Hazel looked up to Agnes as she was much shorter than the other women who attended and waited patiently for Agnes to finish her insults. Hazel had no will to argue with Agnes and knew that other bystanders were listening, none of which took the liberty to address the quarrel but turned an arrogant ear on their conversation. What? Nothing to say, Lady Hazel? Agnes sneered. Does thee even pray outside the chapel? She asked as she pointed one long finger behind her. Where is Alma today? Has she fallen ill too? Hazel looked away from Agnes's condescending stare, but held her tongue as well as her tears. Agnes was relatives with Harris, who worked for the nearby morgue. Word travels fast amongst those with slithering tongues that allow to spray gossip about for pleasure. Agnes wore the title of the queen of the self-righteous talebearers. However, Agnes had taken it upon herself to inform those attending the service of Hazel's new grief that she now would carry until it was her time to move on. Oh, that's right. Harris mentioned that he picked up a little eleven-year-old darling with blonde locks down to her bottom and star-blue eyes. He said it was at the country line where he retrieved her from a tiny rotten cottage. 
Pneumonia, was it not? Hazel clutched her purse tighter and stepped to one side to approach the church when Agnes slid in front of Hazel. My, my, one of God's children is awfully rude this morning, would you say not, Ethel? Agnes gazed to her right at the second most wealthy woman in the land aside from the royal families. <laughs> yes, indeed, ignorance is bliss. Is that not right, Hazel? Ethel jeered. Ethel, you surely must not think that Hazel here has heard of the term. She cannot afford books, let alone read. She only knows the hymns as she sits in her pigpen rump down in the pew every Sunday morning and memorizes them. Agnes mocked. Ah, would you look at that, rosy cheeks on her dirty little face. Ethel mentioned as she pointed her silken glove finger. Agnes, Ethel, Hazel. How delightful it is to see you here this morning, Pastor James said as he descended the steps of the chapel. Pastor James approached the three ladies standing at the foot of the steps as his face lost his smile. Hazel, why dost thou appear as though on the verge of weeping? He asked as he gently took her free hand. Before Hazel could speak, he looked down to his feet, then back up to her with a haggard expression. Yes, yes, of course. After our service today, if you wouldn't mind to stay a moment, may I accompany you to the cemetery? Pastor James, I greatly appreciate your humble offer, but you mustn't dirty your formal footwear merely to accompany an old fool to visit her deceased. What if I were to say that I have a change of footwear that is fit for farming just inside the chapel for such an occasion? He smiled warmly at her. Well, I... Th thank you. Pastor, Hazel said softly. From the corner of her eye, the two wealthy woman's lips had turned but into thin lines of disapproval as their brow furrowed deeply. Agnes stuck her nose in the air as she turned on her heel and began ascending the steps, followed by Ethel. Come, service is about to start. Hazel had a particular seating that she fancied on the first pew to the right. She sat closest to the aisle as the two tithing presenters came around to either side and handed the tithing plates to the first person to give their tithing, then pass on. Hazel placed in two pennies and passed it on to her neighbor as she stared up at the altar and silently prayed. As the plates were passed down, the chapel filled with murmuring of chatter. Agnes and Ethel, who took a liking to the third row down, just behind Hazel had received the plate. Ethel, what did you bring for our chapel? Agnes said loudly as she took the plate. Harold sent me with twenty dollars, Agnes. And you? My, what a grand offering. I've brought thirty with me today. <laughs> Agnes giggled. Hazel closed her eyes and continued to pray silently until the offering was complete and the service would resume its last quarter. Unlike some here, we bring something of value to give to our good Lord and Savior. Hazel said not a word and remained with her head bowed and her hands clapped together, reminding herself that her two daughters were safe now in his arms. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Pastor James slowly closed his Bible and stared at it for a moment as he reflected the service. As he looked up into his attendance, a sad smile crept across his face. What do you think that means? Soft murmurs filled the room as Pastor James gazed out at the discussion within the pews. As the voices died off one by one, he gave another look around the pews before stepping off the altar. He began to pace slowly whilst caressing his chin thoughtfully. Stopping on an instant, he turned and looked at them again. We are not perfect. We are human. Sure, we were molded in his image. However, that does not make us perfect. That verse does not signify that we are sinless or perfect. We are far from it. He made his way to the other side where the right side pews were. We can only do human things, and we do not have divine powers, no. But what we do have is to strive and serve to the glory of God and do the work for Him while we're here on earth. You never know what tomorrow will hold. We should do good deeds even when no one's watching, because you never know who is watching. <laughs>
Reflect on this and we will discuss this next Sunday. As always, bring a friend. We welcome all, no matter their type or status. Conversation broke out in the main hall as everyone gathered their belongings and stood from the creaking pews of the church. Agnes and Ethel had expressions of bitterness worn on their faces as they left. Neighbors turned and spoke with one another, shaking hands and exchanging greetings along with light small talk. The pianist sat on the far left end of the altar playing soft tunes that could be heard just above the voices. Hazel remained in her seat as others passed by and spoke with one another. As the last two couples left together and talked with their sideways glances and slow strides, Pastor James locked the front doors to the church. Turning to Hazel, she still sat in her pew up front. Her head was down. Unsure if she were praying or perhaps reading psalms, he approached her. She held a handkerchief in her hand as she dabbed her eyes and stood shakily from the pew. Are you all right, Miss Allengale? Yes, I need to eat more fruit, I suppose. <laughs> she chuckled and took his outstretched hand. I love my greens, but I neglect my protein, so I understand. Pastor James smiled at her gently and looked to the side door where they would be leaving. Where are your farmer footwear, Pastor? Ah, that was the one thing I was forgetting. <laughs> the pastor chuckled once more. He comically jogged to the altar and knelt as he changed his foot attire. As she watched him tie the laces on his field shoes, she felt her ears growing hot as she frowned. "'What's the matter, Hazel?' he asked as he tightened his last knot. "'I'm in, I'm entirely grateful for what you've done for me, a hundredfold.' "'Of course! A good pastor is one who stands by his people, helps them in their times of need, and spreads the word of God. I'm not perfect, just as I said during my sermon, but I strive to be as close as I can.' They stepped through the silent chapel to the side door off behind the altar. The frame and door appeared to have seen many weather-worn years, but still stood firm in its frame and scuffed structure. They strode through the door and out onto the grassy train. The wind spoke softly of its chilled morning, walking through the meadows a mile down where only the weary roamed in the late hours of eve. As Hazel lifted her eyes from the morning dew that remained on the blades of grass, she saw the everlasting field of eternal rest. Higher unattended grass caressed against the worn pantyhose that covered her weary legs. The stones grew close enough to see the engraving upon them and the titles of those who had been laid to rest. Stones that had seen many years of silence from visitors and would forevermore. Loved ones had come to join them in another life unreachable from this one, where heartache and sorrow tainted the land and soaked it into the soil sprouting their seeds of discord. Deceased left not behind only their worldly problems, but those whose hearts that had reached. As they descended back into the earth from whence they came, a piece of their heart of the living went with them into the coffin to remain. Each stone they passed was a reminder of where all go once their journey is over. The number before the dash and the number that followed bear such significance. Though the numbers dominated the stones, their dash was what signified the lives that were lived. Only those they love know what that little dash meant during their time when they were flesh and blood, or their own, before returning back to the earth. Her hands began to tremble as they drew closer to the outskirts of the cemetery. The heart hiding behind the frail cage beat faster as the world slowed around her. I've done many funerals, Hazel, the pastor began. I've sent infants and unborn stills, as you well know, to meet our Heavenly Father. This man that strides beside you has even sent his own mother off. However, somehow I found it more painful to send off the young daughters of the woman more devoted to God than any other I know. Hazel and Pastor James passed two stones bearing the name of Shoemaker as she lifted her weather shawl just a little bit closer to her but dared not to look at them directly. As they passed by, Pastor James sensed the slightest nod from Hazel, but he knew he mustn't act as if he had seen. He knew this nod all too well, and it was a short gesture that many would miss. Not many picked up on these minuscule actions of the broken who passed by loved ones that could not bear to stop 
and remind themselves that this fate was sown and it could not be undone. Their unforgivable stitches that were tightly wound into the fabrics of time. Hazel took her final step before arriving at the destination that she longed for, and yet it was more challenging to stand than ever before. Beneath the earth lie the flesh and blood she gave birth to and died before their time. Two fresh stones erected a monk's elder, with two plots beside them, each empty of their occupants. She knew that one day that these plots would be filled, but that they had not come yet. The occupants stood on two feet as the cold wind blew through, wafting the single formal dress she owned. The other likely lie in the sheets at home covered in their own filth passed out from their selfish, self-centered ways. The strong stench of ammonia likely filled the sheets, while one lie sprawled in their own vomit and vile sins. A grieving mother stood before her daughter's graves and looked down upon the names they were given for such a short time on this earth, only to return into the arms of whom they were created, and yet so soon. Pork dumplings filled her chilly nostrils as she thought of Alma and Abigail sitting down at the table with their ruffled dresses flowing about while the rumps took the seats in such a tomboyish fashion. All girls seem as though they are boys before learning their feminine manners, now do they not. Even Hazel recalled a time when she despised her dressing. She desired to play in the mud and muck while her mother scalded her to return inside to her chores. And yet her mind discards the thought of her childhood as far away as it seemed and returned to a time when the, her two offspring still breathed the same air as she. He still beats you, does he not, Hazel? Pastor James nonchalantly spoke as he stared down at the fresh stones with his hands tightly wound together. The pain in her legs returned as she felt the bite of the cold grip her. As she moved her eyes down to the soil that had not yet settled from its recent disturbance and then to her feet, watching as the light breeze fluttered the fabric of her dress. Before she came to the service this morning, she stood before the mirror and examined the product of what she had become. Though her poor daughters had to witness it, they had never had to experience it once for themselves when he flew into fits of rage. She ensured to keep him to herself, to never allow the girls to come close when his once hard-working hands turned into fists and swung at them at the very body that he swore to protect many years ago. That world had changed, and so had he. She remained as she was before everyone, and everything moved on. As the years passed, she recalled how she smiled less with each revolution. Those bright blue eyes that looked up to her always gave her such a sense of hope and urged her to push forward, no matter how difficult it became. Now, they were as all the three other stillborns and the two who never made it thus far. The last miscarriage that she had awoke to in her mind, as she recalled the dark red stains in her sheets beneath her as she wailed with agony. He awoke in a fury from her sudden cries. He gazed between her legs and what had become of yet another offspring. His hand struck her with such force that it knocked her unconscious. As she woke with her head throbbing smartly, the images of him blurred then came back together as they repeated this movement. All the while, he shouted his disagreements of her sins for allowing such a thing to happen again. Again? You're not fit for motherhood! Cannot even bear a child properly, you stupid old hag! You're such a mistake! Clutching her purse ever tighter to her, she felt another bite of cold hit her quivering legs. The chill stung the dark purple spots that hid beneath her opaque pantyhose in their vile secrecy. The deep purple was as fresh as last night. Dusk had reached the land as he came stumbling through the front door, smelling strongly of the devil's spirits, and a nearly empty bottle in his grasp that threatened to drop at any moment. His eyes moved slightly side to side as if one had just ceased playing the children's game, seeing who could twirl the longest without falling. When they focused on her at the kitchen table with her Bible laid out and the candle on its last hour burning slowly, his lips spread into a grimace as he bared his teeth at her in hatred. But she had lost track of time. She knew better than to be awake when he returned home. She had just gotten to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong.
that fast. The only thing that saved her Bible from being destroyed was her quick thought of blowing out the candle, darkening the place where his drunken eyes could not see well. Slapping it shut, she shoved it in the cupboard as she felt his hand fall upon her shoulder and swing her around to meet her punishment for rebelling against him once again in her foolishness. She ducked and missed his hand as she felt her stringy hair rustle across her face as his fist skimmed by. Another hand landed on her chest as she was knocked back against the cupboard. Air left her lungs in one heavy sigh, leaving her legs to buckle beneath her as she took hold of her and went down with her. She raised her leg and kicked with all of her might, but he caught it with ease as his fingers clamped down. Squeezing her muscles ever tighter, she cried out. Pain radiated through her face as her consciousness left her. The following morning, she awoke with many dark places upon her skin. She had received powder that was just her skin tone and patted herself gently until the color seemed to suffice. Once she dressed and gathered her purse, she looked at him one last time before setting off to the chapel. He lay in the sheets covered in his own filth as he snored at an unacceptable volume. Each time that she thought of leaving him, though this was against standards to divorce, she could not stop herself from seeing who he used to be. The boy she had fallen for many years ago. He was only 15 at the time and she 13. Once she reached the age of 16, she accepted his hand in marriage. What a spectacular day it was. The wind was calm and not a cloud in the sky to obscure the pastel blue painted over the green hill on which they were bonded. He looked down on her with his vivid green eyes and always felt that she could lose herself in those oceans of algae. Hazel loved the still ponds bearing such and their lily pads floating amongst the deep green. The sound of crickets and frogs could be heard here and there and such peaceful sound it was. But these eyes belonged to someone else now. That boy that she had devoted her life to had died and was replaced with a stranger that she despised. And yet she prayed that that boy would someday return and this stranger would be gone forever. Years had passed and that boy had still not come home to her. Only the stranger. Hazel, Pastor James said softly. Hazel blinked several times as tears rolled down her cheeks. She looked away from him as she removed her handkerchief from her purse and dabbed her eyes. Forgive me and my strong emotions, Pastor. They get the best of me sometimes. No, no better place to shed tears than a cemetery. No need to apologize, Hazel. Hazel looked back down at the two plots before her, one fresh, while the other had settled and begun to grow grass and small field flowers. They are in a better place, Pastor. Yes, yes they are. See, us here on earth can feel envious sometimes to those who have taken God's hand and have gone home. A home of no pain, no sorrow, no hunger, no sickness or death. I'm grateful to have had them as long as I did. Alma and Abigail were such fine young women, Hazel. You were an incredible mother, and I am sure that they too felt the same. Hazel, can may I be frank with you? I, I, I suppose you may. I pray for you each and every day. God's will be done, but I will worry for you still. You're not safe. Heath has grown violent. Pastor, this is the life I chose, and I must accept. He spoke not as he looked back down at the grapes before them. Hazel shed the remainder of her tears as she made her way back home from the service with the cottage now in view just above the hills. She shivered terribly as the wind continued to bite upon her wounds and her frail skin. Dear Heavenly Father, it is me again. I ask of you once more, please bring back the boy I once knew. I feel as though I am a widow living under the same roof with a stranger walking around in Heath's skin. Although my request is selfish, I still ask of you to at least hear my plea. Let your will be done, but consider my prayers 
As she approached the cottage, she noticed that the front door was open as she felt fright tingle in her fingertips. Quickening her walk, she asked herself if she had not latched the door properly before leaving this morning and hoped that no animals had wandered their way inside. Stepping inside, she glanced around until she noticed movement in the corner. Heath? Where have you been? He uttered in a gravelly voice. The chapel, as every Sunday. The sun is nearing noon. You were to travel well before now. I visited Alma and Abigail after the serp- Shut up! Hazel flinched as she took a step back. I do not want to ever hear those sickly whores' names again. Hazel said nothing as her eyes filled with tears. Heath stood from his seat as he made his way over to her. The smell of whiskey hit her nostrils. Heath, it is a sin to drink on the morn of the Sabbath. She fell to the floor as he struck her temple. Pain radiated through her skin and her face, flowing through her limbs, creating pins and needles. No whore of mine will tell me what to do in my own house! He shouted. Hazel did not spit insults as she longed to, but remained silent as she placed her hands on the cold wooden floor and forced her arms to push herself up off the ground. I know what you were doing. You're fucking around, were you not? Heath growled. She looked at him wearily. Heath, why must you think I do such things? I merely go to the church on Sundays and rarely leave the cottage to- Shut up! You defy your husband again and I'll grant your wish to be with your so-called God and those things you called children. Heath, I'm not having an affair, she cried. Swiping the bottle from the nearby table, he rose the bottle as the stranger showed their rage to her once more. Hazel laid her head down on the floor and covered her eyes as she sobbed. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me. We are gathered here today to honor one of the most devoted members of our church, Hazel Zelma Allengale. She passed away Sunday evening. She is survived by her husband, Heath Alva Allengale. She is preceded in death by her parents, Alice Wilma Shoemaker and Harold William Shoemaker, daughters Alma and Abigail Allengale. No other relatives are known or live in this area. Serves her right. Agnes whispered to Ethel, Would you like to say something in memory of Hazel, Agnes? Pastor James asked. A condescending tone could be detected in his words. There is nothing to say, Agnes stated. Ethel? Ethel shook her head and said nothing. I have to ask all who are attending Hazel's funeral to be respectful in my church. This is the house of the Lord, and I will not have such cruel and dishonest comments made during the service. She offered little to nothing to this church, Agnes mentioned. Proverbs 14.31 he who opposes the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Agnes visibly shrunk in her seat and said no more. Let me add that I knew Hazel personally. She came to me often to talk in her times of depression. Though this young woman died at the age of 34, she was mature beyond her age since I knew her as a little girl. She attended church each and every Sunday, no matter the weather or disasters that may have been ailing her life. She never scorned anyone while in the house of God and always was such a caring person. I am blessed to have known her so well and that I had the time with her that I did. Though her days were cut short, she is now in a better place and much better off than the rest of us who are still here. She is joining her parents and her two daughters and she will never be in pain again. The following Sunday, Pastor James arrived at the church well before the break of dawn. As he walked through the doors, he began lighting the oil lamps. He noticed a silhouette at the far end of the nave near the altar. With no one having been inside the church, he grew cautious as he quietened his keys in his hand. The silhouette appeared to be sitting in the seat that Hazel used to sit in. Feeling heat rising in his cheeks, he closed his eyes and reminded himself that this made no difference, and eventually someone would sit there but appeared someone had broken in.
As he crept up the aisle towards the altar, he stared at the silhouette carefully as he tried to examine who it was. They were small and appeared to be female with how the shoulders lacked the broadness of a man. He then wondered if it was Agnes and if it was some vile joke. Approaching closer, he held the oil lamp he had obtained and his keys between his fingers ready. In the case, it was an intruder with ill intent. Stringy hair flowed down the back of a tired woman with sky-blue eyes wearing a floral dress, clutching a small pocketbook. She turned to him and smiled softly before returning her eyes to the altar as if she were listening to something ahead of her. <sighs> Hazel? Pastor James breathed shakily. She did not return her eyes to him and remained silent. He asked himself if perhaps he was experiencing a spell from being overwhelmed. The types mentioned mainly by the women who attended here. In emotional fits or while under a great deal, they would begin to hear and see things that were not present. Though he longed to know what was real or not, he recalled having the funeral service and having to quieten the unruly Agnes and her pride. This was no dream. Feeling much too fearful to reaching out to try to touch her, he thought of something else that would suffice. He continued up to the altar and placed his oil lamp on the top while placing his keys in his pocket. Pulling the Bible from the altar stand, he opened it to the last page they had covered in the previous service, one which she had attended. Using the lamp to locate a spot in which psalms he had covered, he pinpointed where he left off. He began as if he were starting his sermon. Good morning. We had last talked about Psalms 24 and what it meant. I had asked all of you to think on this over the weekend and determine what its meaning was. To come back into this place of God and tell me the message that you received from His Word. Would anyone like to volunteer to come up and speak? Pastor James asked. The quiver in his voice was still detectable, but was able to pronounce each word. Hazel seemed to be listening but said nothing. No one? He asked for good measure. He then looked down at her in her seat. Hazel, would you like to share your thoughts? Her eyes merely stared up at him with an unsettling longing as if she were listening but could not respond. Not as if she were staring at the altar but him and acknowledging that he was standing there. It seemed as though nothing more was present. He then wondered if he might be actually seeing things. Placing his hands together and leaning his head forward against them while resting his elbows on the altar stand, he began to pray. Dear God, am I hallucinating? Grant me clarity and serenity. Grant me the courage and wisdom to know what to do. The door to the chapel opened as a tall, lean figure walked inside. The figure stumbled sideways, running into one of the tables that held spare Bibles and hymns, knocking them off into the floor. Mud stuck on the man's shoes as he left globs of it behind on the polished wood floor, then onto the items thrown down. Pages rattled as the cover lifted from his boots, dragging the book along with it to be discarded and fall back to the floor with a heavy thud. The man appeared to have his shirt tucked only halfway into his jeans as he staggered precariously around, carrying a bottle in one hand. His head drooped as his eyes looked up towards the altar. Furrowing his brow, he bared his teeth and stomped towards Pastor James as he swayed. You... He growled. I've been looking for you, you holy man. You piece of shit. You were screwing around with her, weren't you? Pastor James stared at the man and had yet to move his hands from their position of prayer. The man stormed closer until coming to a sudden halt as he caught sight of the front pew, appearing as though he saw the woman sitting there. The pastor stared wide out at the man and then to Hazel. Hazel appeared not to be moved by any of the events unfolding within the chapel, but merely watching up where the pastor stood. I thought you were dead! The man bellowed. You bitch! You fucking cunt! You goddamn whore! Hazel turned to him during this spat of insults and appeared rapidly before him. Not as herself, but as something that frightened the pastor profoundly. Before Heath floated the same floral dress, but significantly tattered, covered in stains of earth. The body was greatly withered while her nails had grown long, jagged, and sharp. Her face bore two empty black holes and a single sphere in each of them that burned as her mouth opened up 
letting out an ear piercing well. The glass of the church rattled as did the vases on the stands. The pastor clapped his hands over his ears and scrutinized at the pair in the aisle. Heath was lifted into the air by the wraith-like appearance of Hazel as she continued to wail. His face had grown pale as he stared at what had become of his wife. Inches from the ground, his feet and legs limply floated in the air while his mouth regained open in a hole of shock. They suddenly plunged against the pew behind him, knocking it from its bolted place and slammed against the wall as Heath cried out. The pastor watched Heath's back sharply bend as his head went back, hearing a sickening snap, but he somehow lived through it. The pastor heard him scream as she pulled his limp body from the pew. They catapulted towards the ceiling as he cried for mercy for the first time in his life. As they reached the roof, claws tore through his back, spraying blood onto the floor below. Blood and bile choked out of his mouth as he hung limply in the air by the long razors protruding several inches through his shirt. The wraith removed her hand from Heath as she reared back and lunged at him open palm, creating a wave that knocked the pastor off his feet. Heath flew backwards, slamming against the crucifix empty of Christ while the nails remained on the cross. Heath hung from the cross by his hands while blood and bile poured down his shirt and jeans. The pastor turned to Heath before heaving upon the floor. He had not eaten much due to his grief of Hazel and finished his purge quickly. He stared down at his disgust, too afraid to find the wraith were still present. But this was a holy sanctuary. Evil cannot come here, for thou shalt burst into flames. Glancing to the pew, he found Hazel as herself, sitting in her seat, clutching her pocketbook, watching as if she were waiting for him patiently. Glancing down once more at his limbs shook beneath him, he felt tears running down his face. <laughs> Hazel? He spoke in a quivering voice. She said nothing as she sat silently in her favorite spot on the front right pew, waiting for Pastor James to begin his sermon. Several months later, Pastor James stood at the altar stand with his book open in the book of John. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. He looked up to where the faded image of Hazel sat as she stared up at him in tranquil wonder. She now had the entire pew to herself with the area blocked off around where she sat. A sign on the seat read, Reserved, and nothing more. No one but the pastor and Heath had been able to see her since her passing. However, he took measures to ensure that she would not be disturbed as she sat and listened to him each and every Sunday. Agnes protested against blocking off the pew for the dead, and it was absurd to him to do such a thing when others could sit there. Anyone who sat or disturbed her seating was to be banned from the attending service during the time, but may return the following week. Pastor James pleaded that Heath was already present in the church, and like this when he arrived. There had been no witnesses to confirm otherwise, and the murder was still at large, according to gossip. Each Sunday she attended the service. Once service was over and all the attendees departed, the lights were smothered, she too disappeared until the following Sunday. <laughs> 